Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Good morning. Day three is usually when I ask about how much fun you had at the special event. So I promise you this. Next year, whatever we do together, it's going to be special. Speaking of community, today's session is all about relationships. To learn more, please welcome VP of Strategy and Community, Suchit Jain. Thank you, Tracy. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you happen to be, 
SOLIDWORKS is everywhere. Over six million designers, engineers, students, and innovators are designing and creating many of the things we see around us. From a simple chair to skyscrapers or even the most complex surgical robot. You probably heard me say the quote, scientists study the world as it is, engineers create the world that never has been. By late, Theodore von Karman, a mathematician, aerospace engineer, and a physicist. An engineer's journey in creating this world starts at an early age, while they're in school or university and continues along their career as a professional working for a company or as a founder of a startup. We've had the privilege of working with millions of people at various stages of their journey. People like Jason Poole, industrial designer. He's also known as the motorcycle guy. Titan Gilroy, manufacturing leader, founder of Titans of CNC, and as Titan would say, boom. Daniel Boyer, STEAM and STEM educator, featured in People magazine's Girls Changing the World. And Oscar Valesquez, an entrepreneur and a maker, currently running a hardware accelerator and fab lab in Mexico City. As we look in the future, we take clues from what is happening around us to see how we can incorporate new technologies, new trends to empower you, our customers. Digital Equipment Corporation introduced the first computer to use integrated circuit technology in 1965. PDP-8. Now, PDP-8 was bigger than your refrigerator. Half a century later, Apple introduced Apple Watch, which packs exponential more compute power on your wrist. Japanese inventor Hideo Kadoma created a product that used ultraviolet lights to harden polymers and create solid objects in 1981. Charles Hull invented stereolithography in 1984, which today is known as 3D printing. And we have amazing customers who are revolutionizing 3D printing beyond polymers. Customers like Cellink. They are 3D printing life with BioInc. They are leveraging synergistic breakthroughs in the life sciences and the semiconductor technologies to meet the world's growing healthcare needs. Nano dimensions, they are 3D printing electronics. With electronic ink, they're breaking the boundaries of traditional manufacturing, prototyping in days instead of weeks. And meat tech 3D, they are 3D printing food with cultured fat structure. They're developing a sustainable alternative to industrialized farming. So these technologies, coupled with advances in cloud technologies, are digitalizing experiences. They are enabling collaboration from anywhere, from any device. Data storage, data analytics are enabling our customers to provide new business models to their customers. In some ways, creating platforms rather than products. So this world of technology today is global and exponential. Everything is converging faster than ever before. We are on this journey with you as technology changes and you have new problems to solve. Year after year, our mission remains the same, to make our customers successful, to help you create the best products in the shortest possible time. So the future of CAD and SolidWorks goes much beyond design. It is about uniting the entire ecosystem, connecting people, applications, real-time data, improving productivity, increased collaboration, and really accelerated innovation. SolidWorks portfolio is expanding into 3D Experience Works portfolio to provide you with the flexibility to develop products using either desktop, cloud-connected, or pure cloud solutions. But just availability of exponential technologies is not enough. We need to provide easy access to everybody, 
to create exponential progress. Makerspaces and fab labs across the world are on the mission to do exactly that. They are providing affordable and local means for creating products and services to anyone and everyone. These labs are local, but globally connected, sharing and learning from each other across the world. We are proud to be working with these fab labs and makerspaces across the world, and I would like to extend a warm welcome to Yogesh Kulkarni from Vigyan Ashram in Pabal, India. Vigyan Ashram is also recognized as Fab Lab Zero. Alex Natali from Fab Lab Rwanda in Kigali, Rwanda. Karma Lahiki from Fab Lab in Thimpu, Bhutan, where they measure progress by gross domestic happiness rather than GDP. And Toma Vivanco, Fab Lab Austro, Porto Williams in Chile, from the southernmost tip of the world. Exponential progress is also about changing lives for better. Our platform and our community is an amazing force for doing good, solving problems, creating and innovating to change many people's life for the better across the globe. Last year on the 3D Experience World Stage, we heard about the Ellen Ford Project from Michael Mendonca. We ran a hackathon to create the next version of the Ellen prosthetic, Ellen Ford prosthetic arm. The winning team has volunteered and worked all around with Michael and Ellen Ford and almost ready to introduce this next generation of design to his recipients. Let's take a look. This is using a uh, cam gear mechanism. So all you have to do is push sideways on the button. It releases this cam, releases the gear, and allows the finger to then spring back up into position. The thing about traveling to other countries, I tell people that when you're walking on the tarmac to get on the airplane to go do this, look back at the lobby and imagine yourself sitting there and wave goodbye to yourself because you do not come back the same person. The concern that we had is exactly the thing that you addressed. It's so critical for it to look like a natural hand. And so all of these efforts, I think, are so wonderful. So I'm excited not only for its functionality, but its appearance. It just really looks great. I just got a request from somebody who got a hand as a child and has been using it for the last 15 years and grew out of it and wondered if he could have a larger one. Wow. And that's pretty amazing to think of. That oh, hand lasted for over a decade. and. Um, and of course, we'll send him another one. The thing is mind blowing. I can't wait. When do we get them? Like, this is amazing. Uh, water seeks its own level. There's a reason why there's just a good dynamic group of positive people here. Uh, we found each other and let's change the world. I have no doubt we're going to. So many lives are going to be changed by what you're doing. Uh, no question. No question. Whether solving ongoing problems or responding to a crisis, our platform and this community is always there. COVID-19 crisis exposed numerous problems that existed well before the outbreak. We were unprepared for this unprecedented event, leaving hospitals with a massive shortage of ventilators, protective masks, gloves, and gowns. The world came together to address these shortages. This community, you, stepped up in a big way. We saw our customers retooling their factories to manufacture medical supplies, or creating what I call as pop-up factories to 3D print PPEs, such as face shields for first responders, nurses, doctors. Engineering teams worked on solution to solve real problems. We saw unprecedented level of sharing IP and know-how. At SolidWorks and Dassault Systems, we tracked hundreds of engineering projects, some of which we were directly involved in, providing software, technical help, access to hardware such as 3D printers, or even our own 3D experience lab. One such project I was personally involved in was the design of reusable N95 alternative mask. I clearly remember the call from Matt Kearney on Friday, April 10th, 
regarding this organization called Helpful Engineers. Matt will share this story in detail a little bit later. So how do we prepare our workforce of the future for these fast changing technologies? What will the engineer's journey look like in the future? Well, it won't be about college degrees. It will be about job skills. Children entering primary school today will end up in jobs don't, that don't yet exist. Continuous learning will be essential to stay relevant. Just like these engineering students at IIT Delhi in India, practical and experiential learning will advance and proof of competency will be in real work, real world work portfolios. There is a large part of our community occupied with empowering the workforce of the future. There are over 4.5 million students from high schools, community colleges, and universities across the world using SOLIDWORKS both inside and outside the classrooms. SOLIDWORKS certification has become this proof of competency in the industry. And now we have over half a million certified users across the world. So let's give them all a, a big virtual standing ovation. So as you've seen, our user community is a driving force in this exponential technology change and exponential progress. Our users continue to share, collaborate, and exchange ideas in a year where we could not have physical meetings. So let's invite Sean O'Neill, SOLIDWORKS Community Manager, and Dan Wagner, SOLIDWORKS User Group Network Manager, on to speak more about this. Hi, guys. Hey, Suchin. Hey, Suchin. How's it going? Great. So, Suchin, I've, I've heard a lot of what you said, and you made a lot of great points there. You know, our community over the years has been, you know, has come to be so well known for our face-to-face, in-person networking. And so naturally not being able to do that so much this year proved to be a unique challenge for everyone involved. Yeah, and as tough as that's been, uh, members of the Champions Program and the SolidWorks User Group Network face that challenge head on uh, by breaking geographical barriers like never before onboarding 40 new user groups and over 200 new SOLIDWORKS champions last year. Yeah, and whether it was collaborating entirely digitally on build projects or sharing our SOLIDWORKS stories with thousands across the globe, or even holding our annual SLUGME event, the SOLIDWORKS largest user group meeting ever, our community members showed our resilient spirit. That's right, Sean. We all prove that even if we can't be in the same uh, physical space with one another right now, it's no time to stop connecting. It's always a great time to start. Let's actually hear from one of our champions and Swoggin members, Adam Weir, about uh, what these programs mean to him. For me, it's so inspiring and a constant source of inspiration to be surrounded by people from across the world coming together with this one love of SOLIDWORKS to share advice to improve people's individual ability, but also to collaborate on projects and to think about how we can push the boundaries of what good SOLIDWORKS can do. Thank you guys, and thank you, Adam, for those inspiring words. Yeah, thank you, Suchit, and thank you to all of our community members who are watching from around the world today. Yeah, thanks. Thanks once again, Suchit, for having us on. We're really hoping to be back uh, together in person later this year. Thank you, guys. For us at Dassault Systems and SolidWorks, you are at the heart of creating the world around us, and it is our mission to enable you to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Suchit. I'm looking forward to hearing from some of the clients soon. But before we do that, a big thank you to HP, who helped to make this event possible. We've entered a new era of high-performance technology, so you can reimagine collaboration, render in real time, and make magic happen behind the scenes with Z Central, a remote collaboration software that just won us an engineering Emmy. This is Z by HP. Thank you, HP. As Suchid mentioned, an engineer's journey can take many forms, and SolidWorks is proud to be a part of them. Next, 
Senior Director of Early Engagement, Marie Planchard, will interview two of our well-known users, Eric Beatty and Paul Ventimiglia. Over to you, Marie. An engineer's journey can take on many forms. Student, designer, researcher, educator, project manager, dreamer, and more. Our next guests are on an amazing adventure, and I am happy to share their story with you. Paul, you started your engineering journey quite young as a student. What drew you to engineering? Well, I'm really into robotics, and robotics is definitely what really drew me into engineering. Initially, as a kid, I just wanted to build the animatronics from movies like Star Wars and Terminator. Um, and my, my dad had a model train hobby, and so I was able to learn how to play with tools and things at a young age. So I just hooked from there, always wanting to build robots and hope to one day have a toy on, on the store shelves of maybe something I had built. Wow. I know. I first saw you at WPI. You were a student. I came and visited. You were preparing for the quarter million dollar prize NASA competition. How did winning that change your life? Winning I was was huge. And it ended up the prize even doubled to a half million dollars by the time my team won it. And it was so, so incredible because we worked for two years with so many sleepless nights. Um, and so having a project where you put all your design and effort into it, run it like a business where I was leading uh, fellow students and colleagues. Um, and then eventually being able to put that on a resume of something where we competed in a NASA competition and won it was really huge. And I ended up using that for my uh, Boston Dynamics uh, interview for my first internship while in college. So it was, it was really huge and it let me invest in future projects again. Wow, that is terrific. Eric, I know we first met many, many years ago at SolidWorks World Orlando. You were teaching in Seattle. I was teaching in Boston. How did you get started in education? I never intended to, to become a teacher, but um, my undergrad mentor, after I graduated, he called me up one day. He, he needed someone to teach an evening class for him. That led to me um, starting my graduate school degree. And then that led me to, um, when I moved to Seattle, I had two job interviews lined up. One with a manufacturing company, one with uh, North Seattle Community College. I was both eager and excited for either of them. And the, the one at the college came through. And then... Um, Teaching at the college is actually how I discovered SolidWorks, but again, that, that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. So, uh, Paul, you're an engineer by day and night. Can you explain what you do throughout the day? <laughs> yeah, my, my hobbies and uh, work projects are all closely related, it's a lot of robotics. Uh, and so, so right now I'm, I'm running a design firm, Aptics Designs, and we work on solving problems for customers. So they'll come to us and say, currently we're doing something this way and it's a really big pain point. It's either you know really slow or it's hurting their, maybe it's a custom tool and right now on their assembly line, uh, people are getting injured and there's nothing they can buy to solve it. So they're looking for a custom robotic solution. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm working on often during the day. And then at, at night or on the weekends, it's, it's a lot of the same because I'm into building robots for, for fun. And so that's often the same thing where we're using SolidWorks, uh, coming up with a new design for something and actualizing it. Wow. So, so you got projects during the day, projects at night, all using SolidWorks. That, that's terrific. Eric, you were an educator and now you work for a commercial client that uses SolidWorks. How did you do that transition? Well, again, it's, it's, all thanks to the, the SolidWorks community that I was able to do that. You know, I've been a user group leader for many, many years. In fact, I started the first SolidWorks user group 25 years ago. Also, when I first started out with SolidWorks, I was doing all my resellers' customer training for him. So between those two, I met a lot I mean, a lot of 
of industry contacts. I had a lot of folks come through my classroom doors. And so one fella who had been a, a former trainee of mine, about 10 years after he took, took the class with me, he called me up looking for a student who he could hire for, for an internship opportunity. A year after that, I had decided to leave the college. I ran into that student at a SolidWorks you know, rollout event. Mentioned that I was thinking about returning to industry. And the next day I had a phone call from that same fella asking me if I wanted to come and work for him. Shortest job interview I ever had. <laughs> and um, I've been at Omax for almost 15 years now. Well, that that is fantastic. And, and you have showcased both design, but, but you've also showcased manufacturing and the needs for clients like Omex. How does SolidWorks help them in their manufacturing? SolidWorks and Omex are a lot alike in that um, we both make incredible tools that allow our respective customers to create even more amazing products and designs. Paul, I know the coolest part for me is watching you on TV with BattleBots. And, and I even have a toy that was produced based upon Bite Force. How did you get involved in robotics? I first came across it by just searching the internet for robotics, found the rule set, and engineering competitions are really what drew me to learn more about engineering and to learn how to use tools like SolidWorks to get better at engineering. Uh, and once I went to my first BattleBots competition uh, with my dad as my teammate, and there were 300 robots in one building, I was like a literal the kid in the candy store where I got to see all these different machines um, and talk to all the people in the community and figure out that it was just an amazing uh, group of people that were all passionate about building something for both entertainment but real engineering at the same time. Yeah, and, and you definitely have a passion for robotics. It extends as you are a great mentor for FIRST Robotics and the FRC team, the Cheesy Puffs. How did that come about? That came about when I was at WPI as a freshman, where I was in the same lab space where the first team was working, 190. And I met those mentors, and I was just really into the same program where all these people were, were having fun, learning about engineering at the same time while teaching students. And I found that everyone was just into the idea of competitive robotics and at the same time, it's you're, you're meeting work colleagues and connections that you use in the real world, but you're having fun, you know, building robots with kids. Well, you you are a mentor, and Eric, I know you are still an educator. You have your certified SolidWorks expert, which is our highest level of SolidWorks certification. You're a SolidWorks champion and a user group leader. Why is this an important role for you? Well, I had the really good fortune to have a fantastic mentor myself um, when I was doing my undergrad degree. And, um, you know, I just think that it's essential, you know, for, for anyone and everyone to, to pay it forward. It's just the, 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 greatest, the greatest feeling to to know that you've had impact on someone, whether it's, you know, sharing a tip in a, a user group meeting or, or you know, write, writing an article that maybe helps someone discover, you know, some new capability. Yeah, and I have certainly read your articles, Eric. They, they have helped me with the 3D experience platform. So I have to ask you both as we conclude today, what advice would you give other engineers or aspiring engineers? Paul, why don't we start with you? My biggest piece of advice is for someone to find a personal project that they're passionate about. And it could be anything. It could be building a robot for a competition, or it could be you know building a table for your kitchen. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what it is, but when you pick a project of your own that you're interested in, it helps you spend extra time when it's the late hours of the night or when you get across a problem to really tackle it. So when I'm hiring people, we're always looking for what kind of side projects have they done on their own that weren't just part of a bigger team. That's great advice. And Eric, 
what about you? What, what would you tell engineers or, or aspiring engineers that are watching today? Once you learn something, don't be content just to know it. You also have to share it. Pay it forward. Find someone that, that can benefit from, from your help, just like you benefited from, from someone else's help. That is great advice. And I hope our community today got to hear and listen to what Paul and Eric have said. Find yourself a fun, exciting passion and never stop learning. Thank you for being at 3D Experience World. Thank you, Marie. Our journeys are often interrupted by unpredictable events. Last year, COVID caused many of us to take a step back. But for our next two speakers, it was a step forward. Please welcome co-founder of Open Standard Respirator, Matt Carney, and president and co-founder of Fluxergy, Tej Patel. My name is Matt Carney. I'm a recent PhD graduate from the MIT Media Lab Biomechatronics Group. And you might remember last year I was here talking about bionic legs. <laughs> and you know what we left on was that I was going to be trying to build a company to try to actually make these things more accessible. And suddenly a pandemic hit and everything went into lockdown. And I found myself looking for ways that I could help to use my engineering powers for good. And I was looking around, I was looking at face shields looked too easy, ventilators looked really hard and dangerous, but masks seemed solvable. And at the same time, I was concerned about the safety of all the 3D printed designs. And before I knew it, I'd cannonballed into co-leading a team of strangers who were hell-bent on fixing masks. We set out to build a new type of elastomeric half-face respirator designed specifically to address the issues of the pandemic. High quality, scalable manufacturing, safe for healthcare workers, filter media agnostic, and supply chain resilient. Those were the goals that we set out to do. <laughs> and I say I cannonballed into the project because I found myself on the Helpful Engineering Slack channel, which was basically an instantaneously generated open hardware global hackathon. You know, the entire world had two to three weeks to stay home rather than read the scary news. And there was something like 13,000 or more people on the Slack channel working ourselves into a frenzy. So our team quickly focused in on injection molding design that would leverage the best properties of elastomerics. Um, you know, soft materials on the face, rigid materials to support a filter. Um, so we can protect that precious non-woven filter material I'm sure you all heard about, so that we can conserve it to be just a filter rather than a filter and a mask structure. So, you know, we, we're trying to design all this stuff. It's all throwing around all over the place. And I found myself that first week rebuilding our document control structure nearly every day. You know, first dumping onto my desktop, then into folders, then into more organized folders, shared folders. And, you know, there were probably about 50 people from all over the world just hucking out design iterations from nearly every type of CAD. You know, we had SOLIDWORKS, we had Fusion, CATIA, NX, even OpenSCAD. But to move forward, we needed our prototypes to be iterative and communicable across the team. And what drove me crazy was there was not one native data set. So I called Suchit over at SOLIDWORKS, who I knew, um, and I asked him for help. You know, the, the trouble is, I have all these people from different business units, different universities, home labs, all working on this project. And I need to get us all on the same CAD system. And I need document control that doesn't require setting up our own server or VPN into some company's controlled networks. So I talked this through with Suchit, and he got me a handful of licenses to distribute to the team. And he also got us into the 3D experience platform. So we could do document control without setting up all of these servers. And it was amazing how fast this happened. It, all of this happened probably within the first week of the effort. And I think it's because, you know, SOLIDWORKS was also chomping at the bit to help, you know. Um, and just like I'm sure all of you out there probably dove into something too. You know, as engineers, we don't sit idle while there's a pandemic. We try to help. And, you know, I could tell that was true because every call I got on, every person was just so amped and gunning for a solution and trying to figure out how we could all help to solve this crazy thing we were all involved in. So once we had a shared CAD tool unlocked, we were able to just launch into design. We would set one group prototyping design that we already knew we had problems with, but we could still learn something from. While the next group moved on to a different part of the designs, move everything forward. And we didn't have to answer everything at once, we just had to incrementally build our understanding and leverage every prototype resource possible. 
uh, the founders of Form Labs happen to be buddies of mine, and they helped us with some printing and some materials. Another friend of mine has the world's first liquid silicon resin 3D printer, uh, rapid liquid printing, who was able to print these 3D uh, face pieces. So we could actually test the seal and uh, face form of the mask as we were going. Um, and we also did early testing. Within the first week, we were connected to a breathing testing at ATOR Labs down in Florida. We did filter testing in the MIT Rutledge Lab and with a FOA. And we had clinicians on hand at Wake Forest University and Medical Center to actually be hands-on and test our prototypes. And Dassault Systems actually helped us with some of the CFD, computational fluid dynamic simulations, to evaluate airflow in the mask to help us understand why we had to go from a giant face piece to a smaller face piece to a smaller face piece even. And so we drilled the design down and hunted for a filter media. That's what much of the summer was. And this past summer, we actually find, finally found a, a filter that worked for us, and we passed all the mechanical tests. We passed the filtration efficiency, we passed the breathing resistance and residual CO2 tests. So then we created a nonprofit called Open Standard Respirator uh, in order to actually get this design out there. <laughs> but then we learned that uh, nonprofits aren't great for hardware development. And finally, we found someone who said, how about investment instead of donation? So we created Open Standard Industries in order to allow us to scale the production of the mask. And here we are. We now have the Open Standard Respirator. Um, and we just started selling these, actually, um, just this last December. We've already shipped 500 so far, uh, and we're building up a quality system, an ISO-compliant quality system, so that we can actually apply to, uh, to NIOSH. And again, we're relying on Dassault Systems for a document control and quality assurance system so that we can keep everything together and controlled for our applications. Because that's the next step is, uh, it's not just passing the test, you actually have to have all of the quality management system in place in order to get certified to guarantee that everything you're making is actually passing all of the tests and you have a sure statistical assurance of that. So our goal now has, be has become certification within one year of launching the effort, going zero to certified mask within one year. I think it's pretty cool. And you know, this mask, the OSR mask, um, it provides a reusable mask with tight, comfortable seal, high efficiency, high efficiency filtration down to the size of the virus uh, and supply chain resiliency um, with and bidirectional filtration for source control filters in both directions. So it's really a very pandemic specific mask and it has trade-offs. I mean, you're still wearing a mask at the end of the day. And you know, masks are only one way of limiting viral transmission. Another really effective way is contact tracing and that requires lots of diagnostic testing. So let me hand this over to my friend Tej, who is developing diagnostic equipment over at Flexergy. Hey, Matt. Thanks for that amazing and inspiring story. It's great to meet you all. My name is Tej Patel. I'm one of the co-founders here at Flexergy. And like Matt has described and what many others have experienced, the COVID-19 pandemic has really challenged a lot of what we do here at Flexergy. Flexergy has been focused on creating a multimodal platform capable of doing a variety of different tests that you find in the laboratory. Our focus has been using our platform in a variety of different market verticals, but with a main focus in the veterinary space. When the pandemic broke out, we knew that our platform could be a valuable tool to help combat the spread of the COVID-19 virus. As soon as we realized that this would be a huge problem in the globe today, we started our development of a molecular PCR-based SARS-CoV-2 assay that could detect the virus in under an hour at the point of care. One of the key things that we had to deal with was the rapid development cycle of our COVID-19 assay. Trying to develop an assay in such a compressed time frame meant that we had to be able to iterate very quickly with new changes or improvements design modifications, all having to be done as quickly as possible. We not only use SOLIDWORKS for the design and development of our products, but we also use it to support the manufacturing and later life cycle improvements of our products. One of the biggest challenges that we faced in this pivot to focusing on SARS-CoV-2 testing with our manufacturing scale up. As we know right now, testing is a major bottleneck in understanding the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. 
One of our major focuses was on how do we take our current existing manufacturing capacity, which is around 10,000 kits a month, and scaling that up to 100,000 with the capability of going to a million test kits per month. That was a huge feat and required a significant amount of engineering resources from all of our team members. We went ahead and did a massive investment in automation equipment, focusing on designing and developing in-house our own automation equipment that was capable of producing our test kits from raw materials all the way to final packaging. People that use clinical diagnostic platforms absolutely require reliable and accurate results. Because of that, one of the major focuses and hurdles that you have to undergo in a medical device manufacturer is a focus on the quality system. That was one of our major tasks and major focuses for this year too, dealing with COVID-19. We had to spend a significant amount of time and effort in developing a fully fledged quality system where we can manage all the design and development and manufacturing processes from start to finish. One of our major focuses early on when this pandemic started was to focus on how do we document and manage the entire design and development process in addition to our manufacturing processes, which is a key aspect of any medical device. We we're able to utilize SolidWorks to help support all of the documentation management and control that we needed to implement to be able to say and explain why we designed and developed our product the way we did. One of the major hurdles that we had to overcome as we scaled up our manufacturing capability was not just the scale up in manufacturing, but also the scale up in our own people and resources. As we grew the team, we had to be able to collaborate from a team originally of 10 people to five times that in the scale of six months. Tools like SolidWorks PDM were really critical to being able to get our new team members up to speed quickly. As we got more and more people on the team, we needed to get them up to speed on why we designed things the way they were designed, how do we manufacture them, and how do we continue to develop and improve them. A tool like SolidWorks PDM allowed us to explain all of that kind of information to all of our new team members rapidly and quickly so we did not waste time in trying to explain where to find equipment or where to find parts, where to find information. Powerful collaboration tools like those that are found in SolidWorks were really key for us to ensure that we can develop our products in a very quick and tight time frame. Thank you for all that you are doing to help during this crisis. Our next speakers will inspire us with their stories about the process of innovation. Seasoned industrial designer, serial entrepreneur, and associate professor and chair of product innovation at USC, Grant Delgatti, will moderate a discussion with the Bushnell family. Nolan is best known as the founder of the Atari Corporation and Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theater. And his son Brent is a chairman and co-founder of the experiential entertainment company, Two Bit Circus. Take it away, Grant. Hi everyone, I'm Grant Delgatti. I'm an associate professor and chair of product innovation here at the USC Iovine and Young Academy. I'm sitting here in our creator studio. It's our maker space, and uh, this is where we get to do a lot of really cool things. And today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, experiences and innovation and failure and all sorts of cool stuff. And I just want to introduce a couple of really cool guys. So we have Nolan Bushnell, who is, some of you may know, he's the founder and CEO of Atari and Chuck E. Cheese. And we have uh, Brent Bushnell, his son, who is the co-founder and chairman of 2-Bit Circus. So welcome, guys. So excited to be here, Grant. Brent's got a, 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 a special cameo guest appearance. Who, who's, who do we have here, Brent? You know, I, I figured we'd make this truly multi-generational. We got our, our, our little son, Ellis, here. We want to cover a few things. And, and one of the things that we teach here at the Academy is is entrepreneurship along with uh, design and technology. And, and you know, your background has been so incredible. And, you know, among obviously a lot of other things that you've done, a lot of other successes you've had, um, Atari and Chuck E. Cheese, I mean, those are two absolute slam dunks. And so I wanted to 
you know, the last time we spoke a couple of years ago, you told me the story of how you came about, um, you know, creating these businesses and, and really what the problems were that you saw and why you, why you felt that the innovation could solve some of these problems. So maybe if you could just tell everyone, you know, what was the progression of how you started those, why you did it and, and, you know, just talk us through that whole experience. The thing I like to tell people is that entrepreneurship is actually a muscle that you have to build and that so many people think that the first thing they have to do is get venture capital. Atari started with $250. And so it's not about that. It's a matter of knowing and starting and following through and just solving problem after problem. And, uh, and you know, Atari was probably my 10th company because um, I was always trying to make money doing various things, whether it was selling T-shirts to the campus company to started out selling strawberries door to door and kind of taught Brent to do a lot of selling early on to get his entrepreneurial muscle going. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's really true. I mean, uh, you know, I was terrible at baseball, but we had candy bars to sell to raise money for the school, for the, for the, for the team. And I, I, I sold like the third most in all of California. They gave me a stereo, <laughs> but it was that, that, that experience, you know, really felt, you know, I remember you t telling me about a sales pitch and, you know, it was, was my brother and I were selling mistletoe at Christmas and, you know, each one of those things, you know, get, getting out there and, and, failing again and again was, uh, you know, super helpful to get comfortable with it. Well, going back to Atari. So I remember, Nolan, you were telling me about sort of the impetus. Like what was what was the thing that that led you to kind of decide that this was an interesting business model? In some ways, I think a lot of breakthrough things are serendipity. I was probably the only person in the world that put himself through college uh, managing a, uh, the games department of an amusement park. And I had a arcade uh, under me and I knew the economics of how much an arcade machine costs and how much it had to earn to make sense and what have you. Now, just to be clear, just so that nobody's confused, an arcade as in Carnival Midway, pinball, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, the, the video game arcade didn't exist. Yet. Didn't exist. Yeah. But then put that together with Dr. Evans, who, uh, who was the founder of Evans and Southern, and the University of Utah had a video lab. The only, you know, if you were going to see a computer c connected to a video screen, at that time, there were three places in the world. One was MIT, one was Stanford, and one was the University of Utah. And so I was aware of playing space war and thinking to myself, if I could put this with a coin slot in my arcade, it would make money. And space war was a game that was written at MIT by a guy named Steve Russell. And, and you divide 25 cents for three minutes into a half a million dollar computer and the math didn't work. But it, it was one of those things that I said, maybe someday technology is gonna progress so it will be cheap enough. And it did and it was. <laughs> and you were at the right place at the right time with the right idea and the rest is history. Right. Yeah. Well, and it's such an interesting combo to have been working at the amusement park, you know, at night and, and learning about electrical engineering and computers during the day, you know, really novel combination. And, and you know, I often, you know, talk with our, our team about, you know, creativity comes from that, that weird intersection of, of, of domains. You know, you get a couple of things overlapping and all of a sudden that's a new innovation. And, and you know, bringing those, you know, bringing that computer out of the lab and into an amusement park was, you know, was that kind of innovation. Sure. And now you're carrying on with that innovation and what you're doing, Brent. So why don't you tell us, you know, this is all about experiences and that's exactly what you do with 2-Bit, right? So well, and how that was has big, experiences changed? 
this was a, a, a big inspiration for my co-founder and I, you know, Eric Gradman and, and I are both engineers. You know, he went to USC for robots. I went to UCLA for computer science and electrical engineering. And in 2008, we were pretty frustrated with the experiences on offer, you know, and, and a lot of friends, everybody was on Facebook and on their phones, but we really loved live experience, you know, getting people together in person. We wanted more experiences like that. And, and the thing that we were super exper- uh, you know, inspired by was my Michael Douglas in The Game, that movie oh, where they're, yeah. he's basically involved in a game that spans the globe, you know? And, and, and you know, other than, uh, unlike, you know, a video game controller where you're controlling with your thumbs, the game, you know, he had to use all of his faculties. You know, can you run fast? Can you jump high? Can you play chess? You know, like, what are all the different skills? And uh, so we wanted more of that. And so I don't know if you've spent much time with escape rooms, but we really started playing around with that concept years before escape rooms, built our own immersive spy adventure, uh, went on to, you know, do a lot of prototyping and virtual reality for, for Samsung and the Olympics. We were 3D printing various rigs and adding GoPros so that we could th- capture in full 360 what it was like to be on an indie car. And then finally said, let's do this for ourselves and, and built what we call a micro amusement park, uh, which is a 50,000 square foot entertainment complex with virtual reality and a whole hundred seat interactive game show theater, full bar and restaurant, even a robot bartender. <laughs> yeah. It's a magical place. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. But one of the things, Brent, that I think is so cool is, is yeah, you guys had to shut down, but you got very innovative, right? So tell us a little bit about what you were doing, especially over the holidays. I, I know that I, I was talking with you and you said, I got to go. I got to host a game show, a virtual game show. So, so tell us how you pivoted your, your business. And we, well, you know, we had always, even before the pandemic, we'd always wanted the ability for people to play from home some of the experiences that we had there in the park, with the goal being, you know, Dad and, and, and Grant, you guys could both be at the park, I could be at home, and we could all be playing some game together. And the first place that we went when the when the pandemic hit was, we've got this interactive game show room. It's a hundred seat theater with touch screens on every table, facing a big stage. And, uh, and it was a room for live game shows, and not just passive game shows like you watch on TV, interactive ones where you get to compete along and and Grant, you just did really well. So come on on stage and join us. And so the second the pandemic hit, we started pushing that out online. And and it's basically a combination of a live stream of a host together with a a web browser with a bunch of content where we can quiz you with multiple choice and sorting games. And it's kind of a toolbox for game shows. And it's now a real line of business for us. And we did 90 events over the month of December. I mean, sometimes 10 shows a day. They trained me as a host so that I could like add capacity. So that day we were talking, I literally hosted three game shows. That's so awesome. it's been a really interesting experience because we're going to, this is stuff that we're going to want once we're done too. You know, once the pandemic is over, we'll, we'll continue to have this and allow people to play from home, play remote. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. This, the, obviously we've all gone through a lot with the pandemic, but this has really opened up some new opportunities and, and you know, to learn. And, you know, it's kind of my last point that I want to bring up and, and maybe we can talk quickly. I think we're, we're going to be out of time here pretty soon, but um you know, this idea of failure and, and the importance of failure. Well, I think it's it's actually more about confidence and optimism. I yeah. mean, you need to believe you can be successful to do it. And then I also think that if you view life a little bit like a game, then it it's easier to fail. I mean, it's easier to accept failure yeah. and you never seek failure. You don't want it. You you hate it. It's the worst thing ever. But when you lose at a game of chess or a game of Go, you set the pieces up and you play again. With you, Brent, you know, obviously this pandemic put a big wrench in it. But to see how you were able to pivot and, and work through this, I mean, what, what what's your view on, on failure? You know, I, I, I think failure needs sort of a rebranding <laughs> because it really is about iterating. You know, and you, 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 you know, that old battle quote, you know, no, no battle plan survives engagement with the enemy. It doesn't mean that you don't have a plan. It means you have a plan, you engage, and then based on new information, you change your course, you change your attack. And, and I think that, you know, like I love the example of how the, the game Bop It was created, right? The creator of Bop It went out to create a new kind of remote control. And only did he, when he iterated a bunch of times, did he finally get rid of the remote control part and turn it into a toy. 
you know, but if he'd never set off in a direction to make a, you know, to, to fail at making remote control, nothing would have happened. Uh, and, and even our game show, you know, when we first started, it was terrible and broken and the leaderboard would crash and it'd lose all the scores. And then the pandemic just continued. So we kept adding to it and making it better. And pretty soon we had a cool thing, you know, but it, but, you know, I think it's about iterating, uh, you know, more than it is, you know, hitting some final moment of failure and being like, well, I guess it's not going to work. I, I agree, Brett. I, I think, you know, if, if you look at it as these are just the stepping stones to making something and progressing and becoming better and knowing that those would be considered, you know, failure, let's say, but that's really, you know, part of innovation. That's, that's exactly how you get, you iterate, you know, my, my students, you know, they're constantly coming up with ideas and, and you know, it's interesting in this, in this world, you know, we're having to teach virtually and, so it's it's cool because they can use tools like like SolidWorks to come up with ideas at home and virtually build these things and send their files to the school here and we can 3D print them and see if they work and if they don't you know then they iterate and we use human centered design principles so we we like to get you know if if we can get the product in the hands of actual users and have them give feedback and we make changes on that so it really is a critical component to innovation and, and think about how tight those iterating cycles are that you guys get to do, right? You've, you've, you've designed it in software, right? Bits are super flexible, way more flexible than atoms, you know? And then you can get down to, then you can 3D print to the atoms and, and test it again and see, hey, did this thing do exactly what we thought? You know, a, a, an innovator has, has hypotheses. They're looking to sort of test as they converge on the, on, you know, on the right answer. You know, don't be safe. What you really have to do is be, you know, the future is uncertain. And if you take a safe path, you won't innovate because, you know, the kids used to say, I'm skiing. I'm, I'm not going to fall down. I said, oh, you're not going to get any better, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's it. You know, it's it's you're never going to learn if you don't fail. In fact, you know, my license plate, I'm proud to say, says fail often on it. So Wow. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, so well, just to have a little piece of you, both of you guys' minds in this in this one call is just amazing to me. So thank you for that. And I uh, hope you have a rest of a great rest of your day. Will do. Thank okay. you. Thank you, gentlemen. Don't forget to navigate to my dashboard for your agenda and other opportunities in sessions, meetups, and the playground. And later today, you can check out the conclusion of Don't Miss This Demo. So far, Kevin and the team have managed to hold off the bandits for a while, distracting, even impressing them with various 3D Experience Works roles. But now they know Kevin is alone and they're coming back for one more attack. What they don't know is that Kevin has a secret weapon, SolidWorks 2022. Thank you so much for having me back. I had a great time with this amazing community. I hope to see you all again next year in person. But first, I'll see you at the wrap this afternoon. Over to you, GP. Thank you, Tracy. Once again, we have come to the conclusion of our conference. We hope we have inspired, entertained, and most importantly, sent a clear message to our growing ecosystem and to the world of our priorities moving forward. These are the key points. We are addicted to human creativity. We want to give you the freedom to create all what you need to realize your dreams, because we know that you, like us, always dream of a better world. For this, we have announced two offers that will give extraordinary opportunities to the students and the makers of the world, two categories we are particularly dedicated to. We have advocated the transformation from products to platform that will give you unprecedented business outcomes that are so urgent these days. Agility, flexibility, resilience, and a continuous stream of innovative solutions. As we have always promised, 3D Experience Works is an expanding portfolio for everybody and gives you the flexibility to work the way that fits your plans on the desktop, 
connected or in the cloud. We hope to see you as numerous at the next edition of 3D Experience World that will be in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you.